Where do you want me to look? You can look at me. Okay. I know it's hard, but you have to get used to it. <laughs> well, I have a very, very high tolerance level. Thank you. You'll need it. Well, we both have beers. So I think that's important. Uh, I guess the first guy that I'd really love you to talk about is Jesse Stone. Uh, what he was like, not only as an arranger, but as a guy to work with. Yeah. Oh, Jesse Stone. He preceded me at, Atl at Atlantic by quite a few years because... When I joined Atlantic in, in 1953, Jesse was an established fixture there. And uh, he was arranging for people like Ray Charles and Joe Turner. And Jesse, who died just a few years ago in the advanced, nine, how old was he, 94, 95 when he died, was actually a contemporary of Jelly Roll Morton. It's uh, unimaginable. Uh, there might have been a slight overlap in years, but Jelly Roll Morton is credited with being the first person to actually arrange jazz music. Because until then, uh, if we want to credit New Orleans as being the cradle of jazz, which is a theory, but not necessarily a fact, uh, they played what they called in collective improvisation. There'd be uh, the trumpet would play lead, the clarinet would play on top of that. Uh, usually there weren't any saxophones at this time, but a trombone would be underneath, and there'd be a tuba until the string bass came along, which did come in kind of early with Steve Brown, and uh, the drums. And there was a kind of collective weave that they played, if you listen to uh, early Louis Armstrong, Hot Seven and Hot Fives. Uh, King Oliver's rec later records, however, were arranged for sections. But the first person, allegedly, to uh, arrange by section, in other words, uh, instead of just having one of each instrument, you know, one reed, one trumpet, or one trombone, There'd be, let's say, three saxophones, two trombones, two trumpets. And uh, the, this couldn't be every tub on its own bottom, as they say. People had to know what to play, when to come in and when to stay out, and also to play harmony parts in a section. So Jelly Roll is credited with being one of the first, and it might be so. However, Jesse Stone came right along just a few years after, and he also began by doing arrangements. So he goes back uh, to the 20s, or before, actually. Uh, Jesse, in addition to being a, a very good arranger, well, Jesse had a great feel for rhythm. He had a, a feel for early jazz, stomps, rags, uh, early uh, early jazz, which was on the borderline with the ragtime. He knew all the licks and all the riffs. Uh, but he also had a great appreciation of the culture. And he had a great sense of humor. So one of Jesse's specialties was engendering what you would call a feel-good Saturday night jam and it was strictly a black cultural thing at that time uh, white people were not aware of it except for the usual cult of the, the, the few illuminati the enlightened people so jesse brought a lot of humor to it a lot of folk humor uh, uh, some of his lines that could not have been written without having had his experience uh, in one of his songs, uh, he says, uh, uh, here's a dime, uh, I'm paraphrasing, use your feet, go across the street and get me some stewing meat. Yeah, it's hard to imagine a Caucasian coming up with a line like that. And then some of the great lines in uh, Shake, Rattle and Roll, uh, he 
let me say that for the day it sounded very salacious. Today it's uh, it's almost uh, innocent. But lines like, uh, I'm like a one-eyed cat peeping in a seafood store. I can look at you and see you ain't no child no more. Well, the inference, the inferences there are uh, without limit. They're cosmic. So that when uh, Bill Haley covered Shake, Rattle, and Roll, uh, Decker found it, in, uh, uh, they found it necessary to uh, clean it up, bodlerize it, and get the dirty lines out. Uh, Jesse not only worked in uh, R&B and what I call Saturday Night Good Time music, but he also was a jazz arranger and a composer. There's a timeless standard that he wrote, uh, maybe in the 20s or 30s, called Idaho. And that, that, that's a, a standard song that's in, in the jazz vocabulary, it's in the, in the jazz catalog. Uh, then he wrote songs like Smack Dab in the Middle. Again, by the way, I'm a fan of uh, the New York Times crossword puzzle. And don't you think, in this morning's puzzle, one of the clues was exact, and it was Smack Dab in the Middle. <laughs> it was Smack Dab in the Middle. Uh, so Jesse had a great grasp of idiom as well. Jesse also played piano. He didn't feature himself as an instrumentalist, but the mastery of the piano enabled him to work out chords and therefore uh, section parts. He was also good at coming up with background vocals. Incidentally, uh, talking about background vocals, when we recorded Shake, Rattle, and Roll in the old studio on 56th Street above Patsy's Restaurant, there was a requirement for some background singing and we didn't have any around. So Armin, Jesse, and I went out into the studio while Tom attended to the parts and uh, we hollered Shake, Rattle, and Roll along with Joe Turner in unison. Fortunately, there were no harmony parts required. <laughs> So, uh, uh, and Jesse was a hard worker, and uh, he was a very honorable, decent man, a good character. A few years ago, Jesse had retired to, in Florida to a, a town near, near Orlando, and he was given an honor by uh, the Urban League, and they asked me to come up and give him the award. So we went up there, and uh, uh, my wife and I, we had a limo take us from the hotel to the function, wherever it was, I don't remember. And Jesse was just doing fine, and we were exchanging reminiscences and so on, and I delivered the usual enconium and so on. But all of a sudden, he fell out, just fell unconscious. Next thing you know, there was a big hubbub with ambulances and medics and paramedics. But don't you know, Jesse came too, and we gave him and his wife Evelyn a lift back to their house since we had the limo. Jesse was totally alert and was telling us stories about his childhood and how he and his family were part of a traveling orchestra back in the 19-teens sometime. And they were befriended by a man of substance, a white man someplace in the Middle West, who financed the band. And I don't, did you know about all of this? And financed them and really gave them a great start. So. Jesse was one of the all-time good ones. Oh, and by the way, he was composing till the day he died. He'd wake up in the middle of the night, he'd jot down a few lines and a few notes, and he actually performed in his 90s locally 
at uh, local clubs and so on. Can you give a, uh, maybe an example of, I know that uh, when uh, you were working with Ray Charles at the very beginning, Jesse contributed uh, some aspects of the arrangements, and then later on, of course, Ray took more control himself. Yeah, well, no. Examples of that? Oh, sure. In the, in the early days, uh, that would be uh, 52, the first year Ray Charles was at Atlantic, before I came there. I came in 53. But I still, uh, uh, <laughs> a friend of mine once talked about Ahmed Erdogan's and my role in recording uh, Ray Charles. He said, my friend Stanley Booth, the, you know, the great Southern writer, said uh, when Ahmed and Jerry went in to produce Ray Charles, he said what they did was turn on the lights in the studio and Ray didn't need that. And uh, I've called uh, producing, unquote, Ray Charles merely presiding at a happening because he did the work. But there was a definite watershed, which came, I think, in 54. From 52 to 54, Ray Charles worked in a traditional fashion with arrangers, particularly Jesse Stone, and with songs which uh, the company may have provided, and with musicians that were picked by music contractors and so on. One great one that he did uh, for me in that, uh, during, during those days was Sinner's Prayer an old, I think it was an old Lowell Filtham song. Uh, and another great one he did, again, with these arrangements, was uh, Chains of Love, which was written by Ahmed Erdogan. Uh, so there were some good ones, but there was nothing really uh, cosmic. There, there wasn't the Ray Charles that we came to know. In, uh, but Jesse did those arrangements, and also these sessions were rehearsed. Now, rehearsing was virtually unknown in the independent record business in those days. Um, the, the resources weren't there, as a rule, and the information wasn't there, as a rule. Uh, a longtime friend of mine named Hi Weiss, who had Old Town Records, for example, once told me that a typical session, one of his sessions, would be he'd have three or four groups lined up in the wings. And he'd say, next, and this group would come out, and it'd be a piano player, a tenor sax, and a drummer. And uh, the uh, piano player would say, where's your music? They were, we don't got no music. He said, what? He says, well, what key? Hi, watch, it's the talk back. He said, we don't study keys, motherfucker, play the music. <laughs> and then they did their song, and the next group was ushered on. And I, I've described this as the golden age of a cappella the anti-arrangement thing. But as far as Ray Charles was concerned, Ray Charles made a quantum leap from being a creature of the record company, controlled in a sense, because nobody told Ray Charles that he could or couldn't do this, but he was uh, recorded like any other artist. But I think it was 1954, and Ray Charles called us down to Atlanta. He was playing at a club there called the Peacock. Right across the street was the Peacock Hotel. So we, we go up to the hotel to see Ray. We have a little conversation. He says, okay, fellas, come with me. He ran down the stairs, across the street, up the stairs into this little rehearsal hall or maybe it was the mezzanine of a nightclub, whatever. And there's this band sitting there, and we had to run to keep up with them. And let's see, the band probably had two trumpets, two or three 
saxophones, maybe tenor, alto, and barito baritone. Piano, which was Ray, drums and bass. No guitar. It's a very interesting commentary on where soul music stood with respect to rock, in that Ray Charles, in his entire career, virtually never used a guitar. Maybe when he had the big band, he had somebody connected, but a guitar would have been gotten in the way of Ray Charles because when Ray Charles had... Well, let me go back to this situation at the Peacock Lounge. There's the band sitting there, Ray counts off, and here they hit into songs like I Got a Woman, a Greenback Dollar Bill, and it was astonishing because the arrangements were completely done, the band was rehearsed, and it was a total departure from Ray Charles being maneuvered, controlled, I won't say manipulated because manipulated implies an undesirable motive, but we believe that our motives were good. But he made this jump into being his own man, writing his own songs, doing his own arrangements, or sometimes using people like Hank Crawford to do his arrangements. And that was the Ray Charles that became the archetype, the great man who took the songs of the Lord, put the devil's word to them, and created soul music single-handed. Uh, Hank Crawford, did he do any other work for, for Atlantic when you were there? Well, he made his own records. Hank Crawford must have made 10 or 12 records for Atlantic. Uh, he started with Ray Charles on baritone, but then he switched to alto. And he made most of his records on alto. And to me, they're some of the most wonderful records that we ever made. I say we. Nessie Erdogan produced those records. Um, I helped out a couple of times. Hank Crawford's records are sort of... Uh, they replicate the spirit and the soul of Ray Charles in every respect without Ray, although Ray did play some piano and there were usually no vocals, but they are, to this day, are some of the finest examples of early prototypical funk, jazz, blues. I listen to them to this day with great pleasure, and uh, I was in the studio with Nestle when we did a few of those sessions with instrumentals with Ray, uh, Quincy Jones did some of those arrangements, small bands, uh, things like uh, Sweet Sixteen Blues, um, How Long Blues, and uh, particularly Hard Times, which is a signature record for Fathead, David Newman and Hank Crawford. And uh, they credit me, credit me with co-production on that. Well, uh, again, like I say, I was present in the control room. So, uh, great, great talents that Ray used, Hank Crawford and David Newman. David Newman is playing to this day. The last record we made, I believe, was, or close to the last, was The Genius of Ray Charles, which was a huge big band record where we had combined forces from Ellington and Basie with Ray. But until that time, he made scores of records with this small band, seven pieces, and they are the purest. And also, he wrote most of the songs. And later on, he went on to huge success with the country and western thing, and with the big ballads like Ruby and so on. But the what you call the echt Ray Charles oeuvre is acknowledged that these sides he made with this seven-piece band are the ones that tell the truth. Um, another guy that I, I'd love you to talk about is, uh, that I believe you worked with at that time was Ho Howard Biggs? Yeah. Uh, Howard, Howard Biggs 
went to the school of Jimmy Ricks and the Ravens. Now, again, I don't know how much resonance this is going to have for the listeners, but one of the seminal groups, singing groups, that made the bridge between pop and rhythm and blues was a group called the Ravens. And one of their best-known records was Old Man River, and they did many, many songs. There was quite a cult for the Ravens. And the lead singer in the Ravens, oddly enough, was a bass, very unusual, a basso named Jimmy Ricks. And he just had the greatest voice. And he had a very big range. He could get way up there. Now, when a basso sings a high note, you say, well, that's out of range. That's not a bass. That's not the case. What determines what a singer is, what register is, is the sonority and the quality of the, the, of the voice production. And you can tell a bass singing a high note just as you can tell a baritone sax when it's playing way up high. Howard Biggs was the arranger for all of the uh, Ravens hits. He also worked with the Big Three Trio. But yeah, that's what Howard Biggs uh, brought to the scene. And uh, I've got nothing special to say except that was it him who worked out the vocal parts? Is that? Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, Howard worked out everything. Okay, well, let, let's go on to another guy yeah. who uh, you mentioned in your book quite a lot, Harold Batiste. Well, I never really worked with Harold Batiste except once. And that was on the record uh, called Gumbo, which I did with Dr. John in L.A., but we had all New Orleans musicians there. And this record, Gumbo, was intended to replicate, to sample all of the original New Orleans rhythm and blues styles. Uh, Earl King, Professor Longhair, uh, Huey Smith. We'd do a song from each one. We had the Angola prison songs, like Ico, uh, Junko Partner and so on. And Harold Batiste was a, a close friend of Mac Rabinac, otherwise known as Dr. John from New Orleans, and uh, was a very good arranger. He also was very important in the genesis of Sonny and Cher because he did most of the arrangement in the early Sonny and Cher records and got them started. So, when I scheduled this session for Gumbo, I called Harold and said, Harold, I'd like you to co-produce this with me, because I've never been shy about working with people in the studio and sharing the credit, because it's a lot of hard work. It's not just sitting there with a talk back and say, okay, take one, you know, fellas, you know, it's a lot of work. and sharing the work helps a great deal. I don't know how this is going to go down uh, on the airwaves, uh, but i got to tell you this. I had made an arrangement with Harold, the co-produce, and we even worked out a contract that he would get a percentage of the sales and so on. But the first day in the studio, he walked out on me. I did the whole record by myself. When I say I did it, of course, Mac Robin, like Dr. John is a great musician and a great contributor. So I was there, you know, as the pilot or the flight engineer, whatever you want to call it. And when we were finished with the tracks, Harold never explained why he left the scene, but I called him back because he was a great horn arranger. I said, Harold, I don't know what happened, but it's cool just come on and do the horns. And I gave him full credit on the record as a co-producer, co and he got paid whatever you're supposed to get paid. <laughs> and you never found out why he walked out? No. You didn't have an argument? or they... Oh, absolutely nothing. No, we had nothing but good relationship. 
I later asked Harold Batiste why he walked out on the sessions, and he told me Mac was very vulnerable when people would, well, Batiste paused to think of a delicate way of approaching the subject of drugs, offer him things. New Orleans music politics are Byzantine, Machiavellian, and arcane. Nobody knows what the real stories are. The, the, from this ward to that ward, from this parish to that parish. Uh, and back in the day, uh, the musicians, locals, used to be segregated in this country. They had a black union and a white union, a black local, all part of the AFM, the American Federation of Musicians. And it was, it just continued like this to a very late period, later than one might imagine. It went on like that until finally the thing, whole thing was desegregated. And Mac Rabinac, Cajun, white guy, belonged to the Black Union. And he not only was accepted, he was welcomed because uh, if anybody, any Caucasian white person could ever catch and express black soul, it's Mac Rabinac, Dr. John. He was a pupil of Professor Longhead, along with Alan Toussaint, Huey Smith, Art Neville, and of course James Booker, the immortal James Booker. Outside of this, these few people, nobody could play that kind of piano. Ahmed Erdogan, my then partner, once played a Professor Longhair instrumental for a very famous jazz pianist, the world famous Hall of Fame guy. And he sat down at the piano. He said, I'll break my knuckles, but I can't do this. It is so special, uh, nor his piano. You know, I, th I think, it, uh, to me, I, I don't want to take over your show, Please do, take over. but what's important in my life yes. was the non-arranging life that I led. Okay, let's get to that. I think that's, that's important to get to. I mean, it seems to me that there's a, there, are, there are the examples that you give in your book about what I would call uh, are group arrangements. In other words, uh, arranging by committee or arrange, co the collaborative arrangement. And another example of that, in a way, is the is Motown's Funk Brothers. But certainly, you have two great examples of it, and that was Memphis and Stax. And if you could describe your actual working methods with those guys, it would be great. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> one day, Wilson Pickett came walking into my office with a tape under his arm, and uh, uh, I said, "Wilson, you're not mad at me." Uh, the background to that is that. Some years before, Wilson Pickett had written a song called If You Need Me. And uh, somebody in Detroit sent me a demonstration tape of this. And uh, I recorded it with Solomon Burke, co-produced it with Burt Burns, who was working with me back then. At the time, Burt said, you don't need to give this to anybody else. They, this is a record in itself, the Wilson Pickett. Uh, but it was my habit, it was our habit at Atlantic. When a good song came in, we would try to put it into the inventory and save it for the singers we were working on, rather than just record it with the person who brought it in. And I think that had something to do with the long professional lives that a lot of our artists had. Because we were very jealously guarded when once we lucked up on a good song, saved it for a particular person. And so there was a huge cover fight went on because Wilson Pickett's demo came out as a record on a double L label, which uh, belonged to Lloyd Price and Harold Logan. Harold Logan was uh, a numbers guy who 
hooked up with Lloyd Price, and they had this label for a while, which was this th distributed by Liberty Records. So there was a big cover fight. As, as usual, as generally occurs, the original record is always the better one. And I think we made a damn good record with Simon Burke. But Wilson Pickett's record was his soul. It was his song and so on. But I would say that sales-wise, it came out to about a tie. So when Wilson Pickett came walking into my office years later, I said, Wilson, you're not me. He said, no, forget about it. And so, okay, we signed him up. And uh, I turned it over to Bert Burns to record. Bert made a record with him, a ballad, which in that, it was just two sides, the ballad and the B side, and it cost $7,000, which was unbelievably cruel and punishing <laughs> to our financial situation. And he did a duet with the girl from New Orleans who did Mojo Hanna. What the heck was her name? Anyhow, it became a minor hit in England. You know, you can look this up and put it in. But it didn't do anything here. It didn't do anything for Wilson Pickett. And it fell to me to produce Wilson Pickett. Uh, you must understand that as one of the principals in the company, along with Ahmed Erdogan and Nestle Erdogan, we couldn't possibly produce all the music that we needed to generate and put out on the market. So we had to use other people. We had house producers like Tom Dowd and Arif Mardin, and we had outside producers that would work for us. So Wilson and I would get together, and for a whole year, we could not click on any agreement. There was no agreement about a song to record, not one. Uh, he didn't like anything that I proposed, and I couldn't see anything that he brought in. And his manager called up one day and said, hey, you know, let's do this or do that. There's a vulgar expression for that. <laughs> and uh, I said, OK, you're right, Jimmy. His name was Jimmy Evans. And I said, we got to do something. And then it, it occurred to me, we had already uh, begun a relationship with Stax Records in Memphis. Don't miss, Don't part, miss part two. two. Subscribe, subscribe to, to Radio Richard. Are you a long distance truck driver who'll be driving across the country, stopping only at a filthy diner to relieve yourself of the interminable boredom? Great. While you're driving, join me, Richard Niles, for my podcast, Radio Richard. Intriguing interviews and peripatetic performances from master musicians like Randy Brecker, Wayne Shorter, Nile Rogers, and the Yellow Jackets. <laughs> and even if you don't drive a truck, I can guarantee that Radio Richard will spin your tires. <laughs> Don't miss a moment of the fun. Subscribe to Radio Richard. Thank you.